What's up everybody, Chance Jackson here with Realty One Group Prestige in the Portland metro area, your chance in real estate. If you've been following me for a while, you know that I love not only real estate, but I love our community here in Portland. I love everything about Portland. I love everything about Oregon. Well, almost everything. About a month ago, I was able to host a class called Portland, How Do We Erase a Thick Red Line? For those of us who might not be aware, Oregon has a really dark past when it comes to systemic racism and prejudice. Obviously, a lot of those rules were erased and wiped clean, but at the same time, it left a lasting scar on our communities of color. I'm proud to say that we had some incredible speakers that spoke the truth of Portland's racist past and how its impacts have affected people that are still living today. So we were lucky enough to record audio at the event, and I'm gonna be sharing that audio with you now. So regardless of if you're sitting down, if you're working, if you're kind of moving around the house, maybe you're cleaning, feel free to let this play through and just kind of listen and learn something new. And if you know or have some sort of connection, feel free to comment below. In your comments below, please be respectful of one another. This isn't an attempt to elicit racist comments or bigotry or any sort of violence between people. This is just simply sharing the truth and the facts. With that said, please enjoy the audio. And if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe to this channel, whether it's in real estate, in motivation, whatever whatever the content I put out, it's meant to help you. So please, please stay involved. Thank you for everything you've done for us so far, and I look forward to, uh, to hearing the next one. Enjoy. Uh, my name is Chance. I'm one of the hosts for tonight. Thank you for all being here. We're really excited. Uh, so first up, we're going to have Bird with Emmanuel Displaced Persons Association, too. He's going to be here to talk to you a little bit about the history of Portland. So let's, let's hear it for her. Thank you, Chance. Before I get started, Chance, I just want to say I think this is really, I think you're starting a trend, at least I hope that you are, because for a realtor to take on this subject, it's just incredible. And thank you for, for, for putting this on, Chance. So my name is Bird. I'm with Emanuel Displaced Persons Association 2. We are the remix to the original Emanuel Displaced Persons Association that started in 1970 when Emanuel Hospital and PDC was destroying Portland's thriving black community and literally demolishing homes and businesses. So what happened during that time, during the 60s and the 70s, Emanuel Hospital and PDC, the head of PDC at that time, his name was Ira Keller. Ira Keller, according to a 1973 Oregonian article, was concerned with the high concentration of black folks in what was central Albina, the area between Williams and um, going east down towards interstate, Fremont, and then Broadway. He was concerned with the high concentration of black folks in that area. And in the article, he says, if we don't do something about this, Portland will have a black ghetto like we're seeing in other cities. Ira Keller couldn't have been more wrong. The threat was not that a black ghetto was forming. The threat was these folks were prospering at a record rate. And if we don't stop this, they'll take over Portland. Central Albina had the highest number of educated people in the city of Portland at one time. People who worked at Vanport, I'm assuming you all know about Vanport, right? Okay. People who worked at Vanport were allowed to save money. They developed new skills. And as a matter of fact, people who relocated to work in Vanport came here with skills already. Vanport happened in 1948. By mid-1950s, there were so many businesses in Central Albina, it wasn't even funny. So PDC and Emanuel Hospital got together to intentionally destroy Portland's thriving black community. But it wasn't just PDC and Emanuel Hospital. This was a coordinated effort. The local NBC affiliate, KGW, you all write the name of this film down and you can go watch it. It's called Albena, Portland's Ghetto of the Mind. It's on YouTube. It's called Albena, Portland's Ghetto of the Mind. The city of Portland created a brochure the city of Portland created an ogre-like cartoon character named Creepy Blight. Creepy Blight had a message, and basically it was, if you don't get rid of these folks, Blight, code word for black, then your neighborhood is going to be ruined. Not only was there a brochure, there was a radio spot. 
So you had this coordinated effort of folks sort of stoking fears among white residents that we have to do something about these black people. And so PDC and Emanuel Hospital got together and they destroyed. They literally demolished homes. People had owned their homes 25, 30 years on average. They, some people would go home, let's say you went shopping, whatever, you came home, there's a note on the door. The home that you once owned has now been taken over by PDC. You have 60 days to get out. And a lot of the historical record, and I just saw it on the slide, it said 90 days, 60 days to get out. If you don't move in 60 days, your property will be condemned and demolished. If you need more time, the home that you've owned for 25, 30 years, you would then have to pay market rate rent to stay in your house. It was horrible. One researcher called the Emanuel Hospital expansion the most egregious abuse of eminent domain. It was so horrible that it actually changed urban renewal law. What happened right here in Little Sweet Portland? The Emanuel Hospital expansion was so egregious that it actually changed urban renewal law regarding the use of eminent domain and community involvement. So in 1970, a group of folks got together and they started the original Emanuel Displaced Persons Association. There was no communication. Imagine going home in an area that you've lived in for years and you look out the window, your neighbor's house is gone. Bulldozed, just gone. You look down the street, the home is gone. And you're sitting there in fear, not knowing if you're next because they did not communicate this stuff to people. Between 1960 and 1970, they covertly took ownership of people's homes. Nobody knew what was going on until late 60s. And there's rumors out here that say people were given $15,000. That's not necessarily true, and I'll tell you why. Prior to 1969, they didn't keep records of the homes that they were destroying. They just were going through destroying homes. They didn't have to keep records. They didn't care. Prior to 1969, that's when PDC started keeping property identification records. Prior to 1970, that's when PDC started keeping relocation files. There was no one, there was no record of the homes that were demolished. And a lot of people seeing what happened, they just packed up and left. They just packed up and left. They saw what was going on. They didn't want somebody to come demolish their home. They packed up and left. These people were not paid. The Uniform Relocation Act, which demands that people have to be paid. If eminent domain is gonna take your house, you have to be paid for that. The Uniform Relocation Act didn't take place until 1970. So anytime you hear someone talk about this history and they say people were paid, that's not true. My grandmother wasn't. Her house was on 253 North Fargo. My grandmother was not paid. So this is what happened. The original EDPA filed a complaint. They got together. They got legal assistance. They filed a federal complaint. HUD, finding merit in their complaint, told Emanuel Hospital PDC, the city of Portland, Portland Housing Authority, which is now called Home Forward, you all go make it right with these people. And until you do, we're gonna freeze this project. They got together. They came up with an agreement. All of the entities that I just named signed this agreement. The, one of the stipulations that has not been fulfilled, which makes this history relevant today. One of the stipulations of that agreement was, for every home that was demolished, you'll replace it. It was a one-to-one -one ratio. For every home that was demolished, you will replace it and the language goes a little further. It states within close proximity of the Emanuel Hospital project area. They never fulfilled that. So on August 1st, 2017, Mayor Ted Wheeler, Kimberly Branham, the head of PDC, which you all call Prosper Portland, I call Profit Portland, and I'll tell you why. Prosper Portland is named after a failed police surveillance program. In 2014, former police chief Mike Reese introduced Prosper Portland as a surveillance program to sort of control Portland's unhoused community. 
it failed. So then the Urban Renewal Agency, all of a sudden, is named Prosper Portland. Anyway, that's just a factoid that I wanted to share. They never fulfilled the, the agreement. August 1st, 2017, press conference, Mayor Ted Wheeler's there, Kimberly Branham, head of Profit Portland. Uh, Dr. Brown was there. He was a former CEO of Emanuel Hospital. They got together and said, we're going to return the land to the community. EDPA 2, we're, we were already in existence. And by the way, we've met with Ted Wheeler for more than three years on this issue. We were already in existence. So when that announcement came out, we jumped on it. How do you return a block on the corner of North Williams and Russell to an entire race of people? Emmanuel Hospital wants to develop on that property. They intentionally waited close to 50 years. They left that property vacant for close to 50 years. Within that 50 years, there have been various organizations and individuals who have tried to get Emmanuel Hospital to do what's right, adhere to this agreement. EDPA2 sees the press conference stating that they'll return the land. We see that as a way of sort of adhering to the agreement, but not truly fulfilling it. There's no way they can develop that property. It's a contentious, it's a political point. So they're just sort of throwing a bone to the black community saying, here, you can have this piece because we're gonna develop. But here's the deal. That property on the corner of North Williams and Russell is 1.7 acres. They stole more than 55 acres. They're gonna develop on a portion of that 1.7 acres. So whatever they're returning to the black community, is gonna be less than an acre. EDPA2 says no. This is not the entire, the, and I have to be careful how I say this because this is a race issue, this is a black issue. But there are families who we can identify to a certain extent whose homes were taken. That agreement says those families you need to replace their homes. Some of those names are listed in the Emanuel Hospital Atrium. Within Emanuel, Ho within Emanuel Hospital's Atrium, there's a 10 panel history of what happened. The names of the folks who were forcefully removed are listed, only some of the names, because remember what I told you earlier, prior to 1965, nobody was keeping record of this stuff. So now that they want to return the land, EDPA2 says, okay, we're the descendants. You all have waited 50 years. Our grandmothers and mothers are dead. So here we stand in their way. We, we want what's ours. EDPA2 wants direct compensation, and that's what we're fighting for. You can find us on Facebook at EDPA2. Our email address is contact EDPA2 at gmail.com. That's contact edpa2 at gmail.com. That is my time. If anyone has any questions, I'll be more than willing to answer if I can. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Bird. You know, it's really interesting to get um, the real, not just the history, but the emotions and the feelings from a person whose family was actually part of that. Um, my name is Odessina Cameron. I work at Fairway Independent Mortgage. I'm a mortgage planning specialist. Um, and before I talk about mortgagey stuff, I want to zoom out a little bit and give a little bit of context for where that comes from and where that story is just one of the many, many stories. And I'm only talking about Portland here, obviously the entire country has a history like this. But I wanna start out by asking, does anybody here know what it said in the Constitution of Oregon about being black when this state was founded? Exactly, so from the very beginning in Oregon, it was illegal to be black, and as she said, you would receive lashes in Oregon and for every six months until you left. So the reason that Chance and I decided to come together and do this class is because we all know there's a terrible history of racism in the United States, but we don't all know some of the specifics about what happened here in Oregon and Portland. And I want you to know this information because I wanna set the stage 
for where you and your family and your loved ones and community might be in the process of getting your little piece of the American dream and trying to gain some equity. And I want you to know that wherever you are, whatever feelings that you have about it, there's a history that put us in this place, but we also have the ability to overcome that. And so later, what I'm gonna talk about is, all right, so we know that this happened. What's gonna motivate you? Are you motivated enough to decide that your family is gonna be the beginning of wealth building and generational wealth building for your family? And in America, that starts with property. So that's really what Chance and I are gonna talk about, about how to buy a home. But I wanna back it up a little bit just to let you know Another example of when we really get to housing, because this class is called How to Erase a Thick Red Line. So, so redlining is a practice that was begun actually just by this one corporation was trying to do something in their town, and then it was picked up by the federal government. So the housing discrimination in America as well as in Portland goes back to some real historical things that were done to people of color that prevented them from owning homes. So it wasn't just about they didn't have enough money, there weren't even credit scores back then. It was a really deliberate effort for realtors not to show properties, for lenders not to give money to people of color, and to say that people of color could only live in very specific neighborhoods. So in Portland, there's a statistic, something like the average person of color has about $1,400 of equity, the average white person has about 25,000. So when we look at when you are ready to buy a home, um, there is a historical precedent for why you might feel like you're not starting out with much. So I want you to understand that everything that she talked about is just one example that the laws in this country have made it very, very difficult until recently for people of color to own homes. Now, we're at a point right now where I would not say that there is any law on the book that prevents anybody from purchasing a home. But do you think we're still experiencing a psychic hangover of racism that is preventing us from getting into homes? Yes. How many people feel like they just don't even know where to get started and they don't feel like it's ever going to be possible for them? All right. So the first thing that I'm going to ask you guys to do when you go home today, get a post-it. You write on that post-it. I am so happy and grateful to be starting my journey to home ownership and generational wealth. You put that post-it on your mirror, you say that to yourself every day. Because what Chance and I are here to do is to work with each of you individually and to figure out what is your story, where are you coming from, what things in your life have made it possible, not possible for you to buy a home, and then to help you overcome those things. Because it absolutely is possible, but I will tell you that black and Hispanic home ownership are so much lower than they were in 2008 before the crisis. So my personal mission is to educate people, to hold their hand and to help them figure out what it's gonna take in their particular situation to get into a home and then to stay with them through that process until they get a home. Um, for those of you that don't know, people often confuse, what does a realtor do? What does a mortgage person do? So my job is to assess your finances and help you get the money. Chance's job is to help you get the house. So that's it. Thank you all for listening. If you learned something new, put what you learned below. If you have any other questions and you want to get a little bit more feedback or understand a little bit more about a topic, I am in connection with all these people that hosted this event. Once again, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I'm grateful to have you here. I'm grateful that you listened to this entire broadcast. Please share it with anyone that you think would benefit. And before I go, I want to do a big thank you to the sponsors that were at the event. We plan to do many more events, so stay connected, stay engaged. Let me know if you live in Portland and you want to be a part of these events, whether you want to be a sponsor, whether you want to just come watch or, or just be a part of it in our community and growing. Uh, it, this is what makes this community thrive. It's connecting and staying engaged with each other. So I appreciate you all and I'll see you in the next one.